Turn with me in to chapter 24 of the book of Luke. And let's start at my lucky number, verse 13. Luke 24, verse 13. I'm going to read the whole text, and then I'm going to talk to you about it, okay? Verse 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. Now, back home, they call it Emmaus. So those that watch this later, next Sunday when you're watching it live, and I'm talking, don't message me and say it's Emmaus. It's Emmaus back home. It's only there. It's Emmaus everywhere else in the planet. Okay? <laughs> to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they, became, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew to, near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose the sat that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So let me step back a moment and let's... Put this in perspective. Let's just talk it out because I know sometimes some of us read and follow along well while others really don't and we just need a summary. So there are two of his disciples that are walking along the road. They are journeying right down the road about seven miles 
from Jerusalem. It is three days since Jesus has risen from the dead. There's all kinds of things that has happened. He's appeared to many people, but He's appeared on this road to these two men. This is called the Emmaus Road Experience. The Emmaus Road is, is a life-changing experience to all of us, even if we don't understand that, it, that we've all had it. And that's why I started off with the conversation about what we can see and what we can't see, what we can hear and what we can't hear, based on our experiences, but especially our doubts. You see, here Jesus had a group of people following Him. He had walked with them, He had taught them, He had broken bread with them, He had shared life with them for three years. He had built relationships with them and showed them the power of God through His life, through all kinds of miracles. He had told them who He was, and they each began to believe. And yet, He has now been crucified, died on the cross, buried in the grave, resurrected from the grave, and now appeared before all kinds of people all over. But there are two that are still walking, and one doesn't say to Jesus that is now camouflaged, he's hidden himself from who he is. You, can, you may, may say that spiritually, but it probably was also in a cloak. He probably wasn't dressed his normal self. Maybe he, did, maybe he had a, a head covering on. I don't know. But what we do know is they couldn't tell that it was Jesus. And Jesus asked them, well, what's going on? And they said, wait a minute, haven't you heard? But listen to what Cleopas said. Cleopas didn't say the Son of God was crucified, died, buried, and rose from the dead. He didn't say the Messiah. He called him a prophet. One of his very followers. Yet again, here he is in doubt mode. Have you not heard? And now we hear a rumor that the women saw him, that he talked to them, the angels saw them and talked to them. We hear that he appeared before other people. Haven't you, how have you not heard this word? And Jesus, recognizing their doubt, begins to say, wait a minute. Don't you know that He has tried to tell you? He showed you? He's done this. He fulfilled all of these prophecies. Now, what you need to understand is, this walk was powerful. This walk was powerful in this, and that it says that Jesus began to tell them who the prophets had said he was and what he was going to do since Moses. So I decided, and you guys are welcome to, to, to have a copy of this if you'd like, I decided to go investigate. I have 47 things. I'm just going to summarize a few of them, okay? I'm not going to tell you where they were, but if you want a reference, I'll gladly give you the handout. I've got the Scripture from the Old Testament beside it, and I've got the New Testament beside that that it, re- that it references. The Messiah would be born of a woman. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The Messiah would be born of a virgin. The Messiah would come from the line of Abraham. Messiah would be a descendant of Isaac. Messiah would be a descendant of Jacob. Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Messiah would be heir to the King David's throne. Messiah's throne will be anointed and eternal. Messiah will be called Emmanuel. Messiah would spend a season in Egypt. A massacre of children would happen at the Messiah's birth. A messenger would prepare the way for Messiah. Messiah would be preceded by a forerunner. 
Messiah would be rejected by his own people. Messiah would be a prophet. Messiah would be preceded by Elijah. Messiah would be declared the Son of God. Messiah would be uh, called a Nazarene. He would bring light to Galilee. He would speak in parables. He would be sent to heal the brokenhearted. Would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Would be called king. Would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Would be praised by little children would be betrayed priced money would be used to buy a potter's field would be falsely accused would be silent before his accusers would be spat upon and struck would be hated without cause would be crucified with criminals would be given vinegar to drink and hands and feet would be pierced would be mocked and ridiculed would be ga- would gamble soldiers would gamble for messiah's garments Bones would be broken, would be forsaken by God, would pray for his enemies, would pierce Messiah's side. Soldiers would pierce Messiah's side. Messiah would be buried with the rich. Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. Messiah would ascend to heaven. Messiah would be seated at God's right hand. Messiah would be the sacrifice for sin. And Messiah would return a second time. Now imagine... You've been walking with someone that you didn't recognize, but he just called you out for doubting who the man that you were walking with was. But he didn't just call you out. He began to tell you who he was 47 different ways. Now, let me make sure you understand something. There were many people that called themselves Messiah coming up to Jesus. And they might have fulfilled a couple of them. But did you realize how specific the prophets were about who Jesus was? Who the Messiah was going to have to be? He fulfilled every single one of those prophecies. There is no doubt that He was the Messiah And there shouldn't be any doubt that there was Messiah. But two guys that walked with Him saw Him watched Him heal people, watched Him raise people from the dead, watched Him live it out loud in the flesh, and still could not say, hey, didn't you hear that the Messiah was killed? And He's been raised from the dead. So now let me make sure you understand something. I've talked about this for a couple weeks now. Your doubt is part of your DNA. Don't beat yourself up for it anymore. You're going to doubt. You're going to struggle. You're going to, you're going to have issues. Listen, those two walked with him. And Cleopas, we've got on record as doubting. They saw him. He broke bread with them. We have to believe by faith that 2,000 years ago, this man did what, he was, what we've been told to do did. And the only way for us to know him is through his spirit. And if you haven't come in contact with His presence yet, with His Spirit yet, then you have to to really struggle with understanding what we're talking about. Because it says that you can't be saved unless His Spirit draws you. So if you've felt conviction and you decided that you wanted to confess that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior, that was because the Holy Spirit said, Hey, it's me. I'm knocking on your door, and I want to come in. And that's why, even if you didn't understand it completely, even if that wasn't how it was explained to you, that's exactly why you felt the need to confess your sins and say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, that I believe that Jesus Christ came and gave His life as a sacrifice for me, as as that cross was my price. I should have died, but He came for me. That's why we're drawn to Him. That's why we confess it with our mouths. That's why we say the, the, the sinner's prayer. That's why we get baptized. Because the Spirit started the conversation. Here's the cool thing. Yet again, just like Thomas, he didn't push Thomas away when Peter denied him. He called specifically Peter by name. Remember? 
their doubts and their failures didn't scare him and it did not disqualify them from him. He actually went farther for them. Called the disciples and Peter. He showed back up eight days later for Peter. Or for Thomas, I'm sorry. For Thomas. Eight days later. Thomas struggled for eight days. Say, nah, uh I didn't get to see what y'all got to see. I want to see it myself. He didn't get mad. He didn't say, no, nah, you, you know, it, it, it's too late. He showed back up for Thomas. And here, he didn't kick Cleopas to the curb. He not only kept walking with him, but he sat down and ate with him. And at that moment when he broke bread, that's when, his eyes, that's when Cleopas' his eyes were open, and that's when the two of them realized... We've been walking with Jesus and listening to Jesus the whole time. Jesus is not scared of our doubt. Our doubt is part of who we are in our sin nature. Now, let's get this clear just in case you didn't know. God created man. I know, despite what you've been told. He created man. And the first man... His name was Adam. I'm not going into that whole story, but let's just say this. Adam messed up. But can I point out to you that just like Cleopas who walked with Jesus along the Emmaus Road didn't get booted, but Cleopas got sat down at a dinner table and Jesus had lunch with him, broke bread, Probably not lunch, based on the description. It was probably dinner, sorry. Because they walked all day, remember? Adam had walked with God every day in the cool of the day. Adam had a relationship so close with God. But still, when it came time to be obedient and to believe what God had said... He had doubts and he failed. Now God did take him away from the garden, but don't you get, don't you mix it up. You better go deep in this. He didn't kick him out because he didn't love Adam. He still had a relationship with Adam. As a matter of fact, Adam continued to have a relationship with God afterwards. He raised his sons, don't you remember? Think about it, okay? He was cast out of the garden because he had to be separated from the trees. Because he could not have knowledge and everlasting life. Because now he was impure. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But, But fast forward, he had two sons, Cain and Abel. Remember that Cain killed Abel and God came looking for him. Remember, Cain and God had a conversation. Am I my brother's keeper? I will point out to you that Cain and Abel would have never had a conversation with God if their daddy hadn't introduced him. So, God, so Adam clearly did not lose his relationship with God. Your doubt is part of who you are. It comes from Daddy Abraham, Adam. Daddy Adam passed it to us, every single one of us. It's called the Adamic nature. Jesus was what the Bible calls the second Adam. He was the reboot. He was 2.0. He was the one that was going to fix the bugs that had occurred inside of the first program. And if you accept Jesus as who he says he is, and you receive him as a believer, then what he does is he takes the first Adam program out of you and he reinstalls the new version. And now you've got 2.0. You've got Jesus living in you. So now, 
What we want to do is we're walking and we're believing and we're receiving Jesus, but we want to go back to some of the old ways. You know, because sometimes when you pull your phone out and it's got a new version and the button doesn't work like it's supposed to. And we are trained in our minds to always want to revert back to what we know. So sometimes, even though we've got 15 other things the phone can do, it can take our blood pressure and our heart beating, and, and there's no telling what it will do eventually, right? Yeah. But it can do so many things, but those, there's moments where we go, oh, I wish, I wish it didn't do this anymore. I wish it worked like that. That's who we always will be, guys, unless we allow Him to strip that out of us. And we just begin to embrace that we are someone that Jesus Christ came and died for. And we understand that our doubt doesn't disqualify us. Our failures don't disqualify us. Peter didn't get disqualified. Thomas didn't. And Cleopas didn't either. Jesus didn't allow them to see who he was because he he wanted them to understand the difference in their doubt and the truth. And he spent the day walking with them on a journey telling them the truth. 47 different ways of why the Messiah was Jesus Christ and how he had fulfilled everything since Moses. And then at the end of that, they still had not recognized him. So he went and sat down with him. Jesus wants you to understand something. He wants you to understand that he will go the extra mile for you. He loves you so much that it doesn't matter that you went astray for five years. All you have to do is Jesus say, I'm sorry. I want to start over. Some of you guys have walked with Jesus, but you don't need to say I'm sorry because you quit walking with Him. You need to say you're sorry because He called you 12 years ago into something and said, I want you to do this for me. And it's 12 years later and you haven't done it. And what you need to do is repent to Jesus for not being obedient because of the doubts that you allowed to block you from doing what God called you to do to begin with. And I promise you that no matter the fact that I'm standing here preaching or that Jose's standing there singing and leading worship or that Ignacio is sitting there singing and preaching and, and speaking the word to you guys, that every single one of us still have struggles and doubts with some of what God has revealed to us. I've seen so many huge things, so many big things here. He's shown me dreams and visions. I've seen it. I've heard it. People have confirmed it with words. And still yet, some days I wake up and I have to repent for the doubt that washes over my mind about what God's going to do through me. But here is where we are. And I I know that you guys have, have been building on this, okay? I know that you've understood that what I've been trying to do is lay a foundation. I know that Pastor Gary has laid a great foundation for you. I have to lay a foundation where we're on the same page. I don't know where that page is, so I'm having to give it to you before I can launch out into my vision. And I told you, I don't want to go too fast, too far, and leave some of you behind. We all have to go at the same time. But I need you to understand something specifically clear. You are called. And your doubts and your failures have not and will not disqualify you from your calling. Once God calls you and anoints you, the anointing and the calling does not change because you have had a Cleopas moment or a Peter moment or a Thomas moment. Not even your Adam moment. Even if you haven't walked in a church door for years, Jesus still sees you as who he meant for you to be the day you met him. That's an amazing thought. Because guess what? I guarantee you the people that's in this building still have a few things that they don't like about you. The people that are sitting closest to you probably even more so. They love you. But sometimes they don't like you. 
I'm, I, am I the only one? Nobody said amen to that. Nobody said amen. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody said, they love you, but there's some things they don't like. Amen. Right? <laughs> right? It's about time. It's, a, it's, a, it's about time. Isn't it amazing to think that Jesus, who sees us deeper and clearer than anybody else in the room, loves us deeper and clearer than anybody else in the room? He knows who we really are. He knows our secrets. He knows our struggles and our failures. And the people that just laughed with you about it don't know everything. And if they did, you know it would cause problems. Isn't it amazing to think that Jesus doesn't look at us that way? That Jesus sees us in our perfect self, the way he designed us, the way he saw us in the beginning. Because you are always there with him. He says it in his word. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I want to say this, and this is, this is my closing thought. I look at the world. I have a little bit of dyslexia. It's never been labeled. But I'm often people, like even just yesterday, I had written a contract on Friday night, real estate contract, and someone said, is this number right? <laughs> and I looked at it and I was like, ah, no, no, that zero and five should be flipped over. <laughs> Thank God for uh, liability insurance, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't have diagnosis for anything because my mom and dad believed in Jesus and b believed I should get healed <laughs> on everything, right? And he, I, he's healed me so many times. But I do have the tendencies of ADHD. I can, like, I can go five different directions at once sometimes and not focus on anything. And I can be so focused and then all of a sudden squirrel and go that way. And, oh my goodness... And yet he still loves me. All the rest of you will be mad at me. Waiting on a list of things I haven't completed. Or done. Or talked about. But every time I go to him, he doesn't remind me of any of my faults. He doesn't remind me of anything I've done wrong. He just wraps his arms around me. But being in his presence wants me to be so much better. When I get with him, I just want to be more for him. I take the time to look at this planet. I love nature documentaries and adventure documentaries. I would like to see them hike through Patagonia and climb Mount Everest. And I love seeing the intricacies of the spiders and the ants and how they work. And to realize that they spent 15 years filming a five meter span just so they could tell me what one group of ants life cycles were like. A God that was so creative, so detailed, that he didn't miss anything. And some of his creations are mind-blowing. And to think that he put thousands of them together and they all have to exist all at once in a balance. And if you pull one out, the whole thing falls apart.
And yet he looks at each one of us with that detail. And never takes his eyes off of us. And it's always there. Always ready to receive us. Always wide armpit, wide, arms wide open. Robes ready. Ready to barbecue at any moment for the person that comes home. Or for the person that fails. Who is supposed to get it right. Who is doing his work. But they just struggle. They just fail. He has the ability to create storms and destroy whole worlds. But yet he watches over you so intimately like a mama protecting her baby. Your doubts, your fears, your struggles don't take away your rights to sit at the table with Jesus. Cleopas got to break bread with Jesus. Even in his doubt, he got to walk a couple of miles with him. He heard firsthand the stories of old from the master's lips. Wow. You would have spoke a word of doubt and me and my flesh would have marked you off and it went the other way, rebuking you. But Jesus chose to walk with him. And today he chooses to walk with each one of us. Stand with me. He chooses to walk with us. To never leave us or forsake us. Despite us. So today... If you're one of those that have never received Jesus Christ, you are the most important person in the room. I want to invite you to know Jesus. If you feel that tug on your heart and you know that you want to receive Christ, today is your day. Come forward. Maybe you're the one in the room that you've known Christ, you know Christ, but you've wandered off for quite a ways. And today's your day. Today's when you want to restart. Today's the day when you want to say, no, I want to sit at the table with Jesus. He opens his arms to you and he says, come on. He's got the bread, he's got the pig ready. Come to the front. Maybe though... You're the person that he called 12 years ago. And you still haven't walked into what he called you to be. And you've spent 12 years hiding from it at times and then beating yourself up at times because of it. But today's the day you're going to step out and accept that call and say, Lord, help me walk that walk. Help me go into that calling. Help me be who you said I'm going to be. Come to the front. Maybe you're the person that just has doubts. Your doubts have overwhelmed you sometimes. You're still walking with Him. You're still working in the church. You're still active. You're still doing everything you can possibly do. But you still struggle with doubts. And you've allowed it to weigh you down. And you want to be free of that doubt. And you want to be free of that weight today. Today is your chance. Right now is that moment. Come to the front. So no one's come to the front. So that just means that we're scared to come out and confront it. It's not, we don't want to admit it to everybody else. We don't want it to be visible. 
So right where you are right now, we're going to close with this prayer. Lord, I repent of my sins and my shortcomings. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you gave your life as a sacrifice for my sins. I believe that you died and that you were buried but that three days later you rose from the dead. That you being raised from the dead gives you victory over death, hell, and the grave and I believe that you can save my soul. Cleanse me, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Rescue me. Be my Messiah, my Savior, my Lord. Lord, I've been away for a long time, but I want to come home. It's time that I come back to the table and spend time with you. Lord, forgive me for being astray. I want to come home today. Lord, I'm sorry that you called me so long ago and you told me, you showed me what I was supposed to be doing for you. But I've allowed myself, my doubts, my, my struggles, my fears, my sins to interfere with that calling. And I've disqualified myself even though you haven't. I repent for not walking in the calling you've given me. Lord, I'm the one that's struggling with doubt. It's overwhelming me sometimes. I doubt who I am in you. I doubt what my calling is. I doubt where I'm supposed to be at church. I doubt uh, in this thing and I doubt in that thing. And I, I struggle with doubt, Lord. But Lord, I lay the doubt down today. Here, right now, in this place. And I say, Lord, I will not pick it back up again. I lay it down, I surrender it to you, and I don't want it back. Take it from me, Jesus. I want to walk in faith today. I want to walk in victory today. I want to walk set free today of my doubt and my shame. In Jesus' name, amen.